Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. Jason here, and today I have a comparison review for you. I am comparing the original release of Sentinels of the Multiverse. As you can see, I was a big fan, had the entire run, including the big box. Comparing that to the ongoing new release, Sentinels Definitive Edition, the first big expansion, Rook City Renegades, going to do an apples to apples comparison. So I won't review every single character, villain, and hero, and otherwise, but I will observe some trend lines, things that the Definitive Edition did in general to improve the experience, or at least try to improve the experience, over the basic set. This is the second in an ongoing series of old versus new comparisons. If you want to hop on the beginning, get introduced to Sentinels and what's going on with the Definitive Edition, please check the original video, Sentinels Old vs. New, for the base game. So let's get into it. Sentinel of the Multiverse, Rook City Renegades. The first trend line I wanted to note, mostly a pro, was the heroes get going a lot faster and they're generally a bit more powerful, especially ones in the previous edition that were a little bit weaker. So you can see that right away. So this is the old expatriate card. The power was player card. Not too bad, but now we have in the new power, uh, deal two damage and you may play one item card. That's just qualitatively much better. Another issue with the old expatriate deck, uh, if your draw was suboptimal, uh, if you didn't get the guns that you needed or the ammo that you needed, you had very few resources, just had to go turn by turn by turn, trying to look for what you want. Uh, these are some cards, Arsenal Access would get you something. Uh, quick Draw would get you a very specific set of guns. In the new reworked expatriate set, you have tons of options for that. You have Arsenal Access, which works uh, pretty similarly. Uh, backup plan, you get to discover one gun card, uh, which is played out of your deck. Uh, we got a power to let you draw two cards. Black Market, there's so many more ways to just get you going by turn two or three. You tend to have everything that you need in order to really make an impact on the game, where for in the basic version, it might take you a few rounds. So in general, I will take the new expatriate 10 times out of 10. However, just one little uh, bothersome bit that I had, the old deck had her two signature guns, Pride and Prejudice is two separate cards. You loaded them up and you shot them. In the new version, they're only one card. Come on. I want to get into the theme of dual wielding. Generally, in terms of quick starting, the same thing is true of the improved Mr. Fixer. Uh, the old Mr. Fixer just took a while to get going sometimes. Very few options in order to get yourself what you needed. You had a, a card like Toolbox, which when you uh, put it in play, you would draw two cards and then you'd have to play it again if you wanted to draw two more cards. Took a long time. Compare the reworked card. Uh, it gives you something at the start phase. It gives you something at the end phase, a style or an item, and you don't have to play it again. It just keeps on going and going. That's great. You also have this sweet card. Uh, you can discover one style card, discover one tool card. So bam, bam, just play one. And all of a sudden you are set up. I'll say a little bit more about the discover mechanism a little bit later. But for now, as a way to get the heroes going quickly and also to recover from ongoing destruction that some heroes do, the new heroes are far away better. The one thing I'd like to observe is that the newer decks tend to reward knowing the deck. They tend to reward those who've sunk a little bit of time, they're advanced players. It's harder to find a deck that is really simple to give to a brand new player so that they can just play and do what the card says. Almost all the decks reward knowing what's inside the deck. So a little bit of a higher barrier for entry with the Definitive Edition, but I think they've made the decision at this point, if you're playing Sentinels, you're in. So they're leaning all the way in that direction. My number two trend line that I detected for the Definitive Edition, they reduced the amount of feast or famine that occurred in some of the old decks, and they opted for a more consistent set of effects for the new one. That's a mix for me. So I'll use setback as the example. Here's the old one and the new one. The old setback was kind of a mess, but in a glorious way. So the way the old setback worked is that you would build up your power tokens. So then a power like this, you would add three tokens to your unlucky pool. And then if you had 10 or more, you would do yourself three psychic damage. And the way that worked was that there were other cards that if you did yourself damage, you could build up your pool. The point of that was to do uh, effects like this. Setback deals one target and himself uh, 
as much psychic damage as there are tokens in your unlucky pool. So that created a situation where you pushed your luck. Can I get 10 tokens, 12 tokens? I have seen 27 tokens used <laughs> to unleash heck upon the villain, which was really hard. You had to be really careful. It was an exciting kind of management thing. So that was the feast. The famine being you could die in turn three and you did nothing throughout the game. They have reworked the character for the Definitive Edition pretty much entirely. Same concept of uh, bad things and good things happen, but they've reordered things in the sense that you play your unlucky cards and the unlucky cards upon play usually do a good thing for the heroes. And then when it gets back around to setbacks next turn, the start phase would usually be some kind of bad thing. So the idea being they want to play a bunch of cards uh, and then be able to use a card like a lucky card in order to get rid of those unlucky cards before it's too painful. So in the old paradigm, you built up, you built up, you built up and possibly hit this amazing thing. Here, you're building up, tearing down, building up, tearing down. It's much steadier. Which do I prefer? Oh man, I really miss those home run moments of the old version, but I can see why they approached it differently in the new. One very quick comment about the Night Mist deck, old and new. They generally work the same, so you're familiar with the old deck, put out your relics. Uh, the relics allow you to do spells, reflect damage. I love Night Mist. <laughs> it's generally unchanged in the new version, but here is a subtle thing that they did to kind of reflect that reduction of feast or famine effects. So in the old version of her key card, this is the card that you want, Amulet of the Elder Gods. You, the first time Night Mist will be dealt damage, each turn you may discard two cards, redirect that damage, any damage whatsoever. In the new version, when Night Mist will be dealt infernal damage, you can bury a card, one card, and you may redirect that damage. So, in the old game, any time damage came in, if you had a big fat hand of cards, redirect, 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 it was an awesome kind of Nova end of the game if you were able to get her card draw up here. The infernal damage mostly comes from her, so she'll damage herself a little bit, spit something out. So again, steadier, steadier, where this was much more of a Nova type effect. Again, uh, it depends on your play style, but I kind of miss what happened in the old version. So let me get into a couple of mechanisms I found a little bit more difficult and more critical of them. Um, it's still a mix for me at this point, but I did want to flag them. So the first one is the discover mechanism, and I'll use Alpha as an example. Alpha is a brand new character in this set. Uh, she is a werewolf. Her power is to discover one aspect card. So aspects are her uh, growing in power as a werewolf, powerful frame, eyes for the hunt. Uh, insatiable hunger these are buff cards you discover them which means that you take the top instance of them from the deck uh, as you look through it you shuffle them back and then you put your deck back so then by the turn a uh, three or four you're going to have a bunch of these aspect cards out and you have plenty of other cards that have you discovering cards discover one aspect card discover one aspect card Summon, Silver Binding. Summon is picking out a specific card, and then you have to reshuffle again. That's a lot of shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Uh, if you're playing a card battling game, I'm thinking like Magic the Gathering or something else, uh, you don't go through your deck that much. You just play what, what comes on top. Here, you're constantly futzing with your deck. Um, don't like the physicality of it also. Uh, because you're seeking out those same cards, the heroes tend to play out a little bit of similar way every time because you can access your key cards early. Is that the kind of play style you want? Uh, I'm just gonna note that for people to figure out for themselves. So when it comes to the heroes, I can see people getting into that. You get to know your own deck intimately. You're getting out your best cards. You have resources for it. That could be fun. The villains, many of them also rely on that discover mechanism. Uh, not as fun to kind of futz around with their decks. After all, they're the enemy. So then you have, as an example, the chairman and the operative. The operative has you discover one underboss card. And it just so happens that those underboss cards summon their own thug card. So you're summoning, summoning out of that deck. The Morrigan and the Dagda, which is the fake card, a new enemy, discover one bond card. Discover it and reshuffle. Uh, they're also extra plays. So you have Kismet. Reveal the top card of the villain deck. If it is a lucky card, play it. If not, uh, you know, do something else extra plays extra plays i realize that the original villains had a sense of extra plays but i feel like it's maxed out uh in this set i have found that my games of definitive edition are about two rounds shorter 
uh, than in the basic game because so many cards come out at once from the villains and from the heroes. The games are the same length uh, because you still got to go through the same amount of hit points, but there's so much more text and so much more cards in the play area quickly. At times, especially if it was a villain that I wasn't as familiar with, I found all those cards flowing out to the player at once a little bit overwhelming. So let's talk about the environments for just a little bit. I'm not going to go over every single environment. Uh, just want to say overall, uh, they do what they're intended to do. So we have battles with the same heroes versus the same villain. They could play out very, very differently depending on in which environment that uh, battle is set. And the decks generally do that. They do impact the game and make each game feel different. Where it's a mix for me is how it accomplishes that difference. So my personal preference is for something like the Realm of Discord. So then you play a card, it does a thing. And then if you play the next card, it'll say... Uh, after you do, after this card is played, destroy all other distortion cards. So this would be a distortion card and then get rid of it. And then now you have a new set of conditions. It keeps that area nice and clear, easy to understand. Also impacting the game. That's pretty cool. Here is the Temple of Zulong. Uh, they tend to rely on a lot of targets spitting out, including these annoying ninjas <laughs> that, that leap on top of your deck. Uh, but that's all right. So... You can get overwhelmed by these if you're not managing them, but at least you have a chance. You know, you could, you know, tune towards area of effect, uh, you know, hit a lot of things at once. It gives you a chance while remaining interesting. So I'll take the Temple of Zhulong. Where I got really frustrated were environments like the Diamond Matter. So then the Diamond Matter had a bunch of uh, areas that I think this is kind of Night Mist Matter, same thing, Doctor Strange, and a bunch of different stuff comes out, relics come out, and different rooms come out, and then you have a card that says, discover an ongoing card, discover a relic, so you're playing two cards at once, and they don't go anywhere, and you might have a game where you have the entire deck just frittered around, and then the entire the environment, uh, end of turn, you're like, okay, boom, 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 and I haven't even touched the villain yet. That can get super frustrating so there are certain decks that i know i will avoid and the diamond matter is probably one of them unless i'm playing with somebody who can keep track of all that getting back to the pro side uh they did rework a lot of the existing villains especially these two spite and gloom weaver which fell the shortest uh, i would say of the intended experience of what actually played on the table so first of all there is spite infamous for being really really frustrating uh when spite deals damage on his front side he regains that much hp so whatever you do to him especially in the early game he'll undo and then you had to wait for him to do his flip condition this is the way you would kill him on his flip side but in order to flip he had to have all of his quote-unquote drug cards out in play and the drug cards were frustrating i mean look at this uh, so this compound is a drug whenever a hero uses a power spite deals them to toxic damage and they discard uh, the five, top five cards in our deck. So basically you're telling the players, don't play. <laughs> don't use your powers, don't do damage to Spite, wait, wait, wait until they get the drug cards out and then pray that you've set up enough to take Spite down. Really frustrating uh, the play style. The new Spite got rid of the drugs, they're, they're still in here, but they're just ongoing cards. Uh, has minus two uh, damage reduction on the front side. So, you know, that's overcomable. That's not uh, too bad. And then they key off more on the bystanders. So you want to try to uh, make sure that you have saved some of the bystanders. They do good things. Uh, so you're invested in them. You want to save them. So that's what you want with Spite. And they were able to deliver that a lot better uh, in this version. So Gloob Weaver is another example. Uh, so their concept is that they are this cult-like figure and they're trying to use their uh, relics in order to summon infernal powers. At the start of the villain turn, if there are three villain relics in play, flip Gloob Weaver's villain character card. They didn't have a lot of resources to kind of pull out the relic cards. It came out once per turn. And so there was never that <laughs> trigger. So why even have a trigger if it's never going to occur? The new Gloom Weaver fixes that, uh, so you have a situation where they're going to play extra cards if they don't have the requisite cards in play, and also uh, a lot of their relics are going to do the same thing, discover zombie cards. So runs into the same issue I was discussing before. It's another villain where it's like you're just going to you know, shuffle the, the villain deck a lot and have a lot in front of you, but the virtue is that they do get going faster. It is a much more kinetic rock'em sock'em 
battle. And so I hope you enjoyed that in-depth look at all the trend lines that I observed in the new set, Sentinels, Rook City, Renegades. I will have an old versus new of the next set and the next set after that when they come out. We love Sentinels over here. Uh, despite the difficulties, there's enough in there to keep me playing for a long time to come. This is Jason with the One Stop Co-op Shop, reminding you that we'll see you at the next stop.